So I'm going to start this video out with an important character. Most of you are familiar with the birth house. This is where Elvis was born. This is the birthplace. This was owned by Orville Bean, the man that you see on the right, the land was. And he actually gave or, or provided the building material and the land let Vernon Investor Presley build the house and they made payments to him and that's how it worked. So that kind of gives you an idea about the rest of this story. And Vernon worked for Orville Bean at times and Orville is how he ended up in jail. But some of you that think you already know the story have been told that Vernon was a forgerer. And that is not entirely true. That is a myth and we're going to uncover why Vernon actually ended up in jail. And it was not that he forged anything. Check this out. So friends, you may or may not have seen the video I did earlier of the Tupelo Mill Village area where Gladys worked in this garment factory right here. And I mentioned that she moved to a house shortly after Vernon went to jail. We're going to talk about how Vernon went to jail and exactly what happened and how Gladys got him out. Stay tuned. Five ten and a half. Five ten. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay. I knew it was a yeah. Like three digits. Five ten and a half. Yeah. Uh, I don't need to look. But that's up. right by that factory, and that's a different story, friends. So we'll dig into that on something but, else. But yeah, she had worked in that factory while she was before and during her pregnancy with Elvis, oh, and okay. when Elvis was born. Uh, you know, Elaine could not have come to Tupelo at a better time because everybody was still alive. We even got to talk to Gladys's contemporaries, her childhood contemporaries that grew up with her, uh, her co-workers at the factory, and uh, some of whom were acquaintances and or f friends of mine because my family came from that same economic background. Uh, they had moved from the farms to East Tupelo, just like uh, Gladys's family had moved from the farms to East Tupelo. <coughs> and they were factory workers, my parents. Uh, and one of the ladies in the historical society who uh, I was real close to, Mrs. Murtis Finley Collins, was she was a school teacher, but during uh, the Depression, uh, she went to work in the factory. Uh, she couldn't get a job teaching and worked with Gladys and when Elvis was born uh, the line that Gladys worked on all pitched in and made up money which is not uncommon but because of who they were any special they'd done it for anybody and Murtis had to pass their house the birthplace on the way home because she lived at Eggville and she carried the money by, and she said the instructions from all the girls were be sure and don't give it to him, meaning Vernon. Be sure you give it to Gladys because they knew Vernon would just go through it like, as my daddy used to say, and I never did, did know why he said it. Well, something like castor oil through a witter. He called him a witter, a witter woman. And I never, I always <laughs> wanted to ask him, I don't know what you mean, Daddy. I wished I'd have asked because he was always saying yeah. that phrase. Uh, so and when she was Gladys pregnant would, with him and she worked at that factory, yes. they lived at the birth house? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They lived at the birth house until he's three years old and Vernon goes to prison. Okay. And then that's when they have to go to Maple Street. Okay, so Maple Street was the next house. Yes. Okay. And the whole time they were on Maple, Gladys never worked a job. Now, she worked getting Vernon out of prison, and I'll show you that. All so the she that were did... Written, she did not, when they were at Maple, even though it was right by the factory, yeah. she didn't walk no. to that factory. No. Okay. All right. She was busy getting him out of prison. So let's talk about her getting him out of prison. I had Lori look at this photo, and we don't know the exact date, but she estimates that Elvis was between two and three in this photo, and I think that's, that's very viable. Uh, Vernon went to jail... Uh, when he was between two and three. So somewhere close to that. And even look at the photo. Look at her face. Gladys looks worried in this photo to me. And Vernon, you know, most people smile in their family portrait. You notice there's no smiles here. So this was a very, very hard time of their life. And uh, I'm going to show you some letters, the actual letters of that Vernon 
or I actually that Gladys wrote to the governor to try to get Vernon out of prison. But first, I'm going to read you the letter that uh, Orville Bean wrote to try to get Vernon out of prison, where Orville explains what happened. He tells you what actually happened and why Vernon ended up in jail. And then he pleads with the governor to let Elvis out. So the guy who was wrong that put Vernon in jail ended up getting him out of jail. So let's look at the date, December 16th, 1938. Elvis would have been four in uh, just a few weeks. Vernon had been in the jail for over one year. He went in in November. His trial was not until spring, and then they sentenced him to three years. In here, he tells what happened. He said, this young man pled guilty at the May term, 1938, at the Circuit Court of Lee County, Mississippi, on the charge of forgery and was sentenced to serve three years in the state penitentiary. This young man, who is 23 years of age, was raised here has never been in any trouble whatever until this came up. And this is uh, Orville Bean's story. This is what he said about it. I bought a hog from Mr. Presley and gave him a check for it. And he allowed two other young men to see the check and copy the signature, and the other men forged checks on me. And I understand they paid Presley about $15 of the money they got on the forged checks for allowing him to copy the signature of the legitimate check I gave him and not saying anything about it. But when Presley was asked about the matter, he told the whole truth at the very beginning. This young man has a wife and one small child that are in financial distress, and they need him very badly. He is not a bad man and has never been. The money was re- paid to me and this man realizes the mistake he has made and I believe that he has been sufficiently punished. He is a splendid young man and if given a chance I confidently believe he will make a good and useful citizen. And for these reasons I respectfully ask you to grant him a pardon. Yours truly O.S. Bean. Orville S. Bean. So what this says is the thing you got to understand is Orville knew that they were in financial distress because he is who they made the payments to the birth house to and he knows that they were unable able to make the payment. So he was trying to help Vernon get out. So I say that Orville Bean did his part here, even though he was the wronged party. Three years is a lot for this. And there's another little piece to the story. And that is they were paid about $4 from what I can remember uh, for the hog. And they felt like they should have been paid more than that. The forged checks that they are talking about totaled about $40. The other two guys kept the 25 and split it between them. And then Vernon got about 15. And I believe those numbers to be pretty accurate. And one little last thought here is that another myth has been busted because most, by most accounts, when you read it, Vernon is the one that forged the checks. According to Orville Bean, Vernon did not forge the checks. All he did was allow those guys to copy his signature. So those accounts are wrong. This letter is from Gladys. It says, Dear Sir, my husband was convicted and sent to prison at Parchman, Mississippi. He was convicted along with two others for forgery. Will you please turn him loose and give him a parole or pardon either? I am begging you to please turn him loose. I am sure God will bless you if you will. We feel like you are a just man. I am asking you from the bottom of my heart to turn him loose, for I feel and know that his punishment is enough for the little crime he did. My health is bad, and I am not able to do the work. I have no mother or daddy and no one to lash to for a living. I have a little boy three years old. Please send him home to his wife and baby. His mother is grieved about it and will rejoice if you would set him free, trusting that you will hear my plea with God's blessing upon you, Miss Vernon Presley, Tupelo, Mississippi. That was written November 25th, 1938, which if you'll remember is before the Orville Bean letter. So she wrote this and then Orville Bean. Look at the handwriting. Uh, if you look at her signatures on some other things, her handwriting was not that good. I don't know who wrote this, but it was definitely not Gladys, but it was written for Gladys. It's what she said out of her heart. And if you notice, she mentions God a lot, and she uh, mentions that they need Vernon to come home because they can't make a living. She can't work. Her health is not good. It's all very interesting.
And something else Gladys did was run around and had uh, these people sign these petitions. We, the undersigned, do respectfully petition your excellency to grant Vernon Presley, who pled guilty at the May term 1938, of the Circuit Court of Lee County, Mississippi, on a charge of forgery and sentenced to the state penitentiary for a term of three years, a full and complete pardon and assigned as reasons thereof following. First, the only connection this man had with the offense committed was to accept $15, not to tell on the other parties connected with the crime, but immediately told the truth when asked about it. Second, this is a young man, 23 years of age, has a wife and one child dependent upon him to support and maintenance, and has never been charged with any other offense. Third, we believe that this man has sufficiently been punished and he ought to be granted a suspension of sentence and a full and complete pardon. Respectfully submitted on behalf of Vernon Presley. All these people signed it. And notice down at the bottom, J.D., Jesse D. Presley, Minnie Presley, and Gladys Presley. And this is another one. Now, these are not uh, dated. I don't see any dates on them, but it gives you a little bit of an idea. It says, Dear Governor, we, the undersigned citizens, respectfully petition you to suspend the sentence imposed on Vernon Presley at the May term of the Circuit Court of Lee County, 1938. Vernon Presley is a young man, only 23 years of age. He has a wife and a baby who will become objects of charity if he is taken away from them at this time. Vernon Presley has never been guilty of any crime prior to this occasion. He was sentenced to serve a term of three years in the state penitentiary by Circuit Judge of Lee County on a charge of aiding and abetting in passing a forged instrument. We believe this young man has learned his lesson and that justice will be best served by issuing a suspended sentence for him at this time. Respectfully submitted. All these people signed and you see M.L. Hollis Minister right there at the top right. And if you look through here, you'll probably recognize some of these names. So I'm not going to let it run long. You just pause and you can read all the names that you want to and you'll recognize some of these names for sure. Now, the last document that I have is where after he was out, they were trying to get him a full pardon. And it says, we, the undersigned, do respectfully ask that you grant to Vernon Presley, who is now under a suspended sentence until August 6, 1939, a full and complete pardon and assigned as reasons there of the following. First, this man has never been in any trouble whatever except for which he was sentenced to the penitentiary and we believe that he has been sufficiently punished. Second, Vernon Presley has a young wife and one child, a boy about four years of age that are dependent upon him and since his sentence has been suspended, he has been living with, taking care and supporting his family and making an upright citizen. Third, the members of this little family are happy and getting along nicely and his wife and child are unable to make a living without the husband. And this is signed by many people. One of them is uh, Roy Martin, the mayor of East Tupelo, which is where they live uh, in some later times, as you heard Roy talking about. Check it out. The next document is more people that signed it. And if you look at the very top right, it says Miss Erin Kennedy, which is supposedly Elvis's friend that they named Elvis after, her son. So how did she survive financially during this time? Living off of her... Aunt, I mean, her aunt and uncle took her in and took care of it. So that was their house on May. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, that okay. was their oh, house. Oh, okay. That makes sense. And, I, and she lived with them in that house okay. and with their kids. Okay. Let, let me zoom in on mm -hmm. that. So that's Jesse wrote and signed it, autographed it with two S's. This is actually thanking the governor uh, for pardoning him, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, he got a pardon because yeah, I, giving I, an I saw the a chance. newspaper article. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the telegram from the governor pardoning him, it's in these files. So he too. would have been there for like three years if he hadn't got pardoned. Oh, yeah. And just so you know, Parchman was not a walk in the park. Back then, they believed in punishing people. Nowadays, they slap people on the hand. But back then, it was a real punishment to be there. And Cool Hand Luke, the movie, and also Old Brother Where Art Thou were both based off of this particular prison, Parchman. So when you watch these movies, keep in mind that that is where Vernon was in that kind of setup, which could not have been pleasant. And I'm sure he remembered that for the rest of his life as well as being poor. So friends, they asked for a pardon, but Vernon was a convicted felon at this point, which made it hard for him to get a job. He was indeed pardoned by the governor at about his uh, Elvis's sixth birthday is what we estimate. But I want you to look back at this photograph right here again. Notice that Gladys's hand is on Vernon's shoulder 
as if to try to keep her family together. This had to be a sad time, and I don't think she knew at this moment that he was going to be arrested. I think this was just before that happened. But this could have theoretically, Lori said he could be four years old at this time, so this could have been when he got out of jail. I don't know if this is before or after, but we do know it was during that period of time, and that had to really scar them. And I also heard stories that Noah, Vernon's brother, was actually the mayor of Tupelo at a point, and he would take the local school bus and take Gladys and Elvis to see Vernon at Parchment. I believe that to be a fact. I believe that is absolutely a true story. This is just another piece of that Elvis puzzle that you have to understand that these people were poor. When I say poor, they were poor. $15, which is what Vernon received for his part in that, was a lot of money at that time. And I'm sure that they really needed it. So now that gives you a little bit more insight on why Vernon was so tight with Elvis's money. He was afraid they might be poor again. And Gladys tightened up and got Vernon out of jail. Yes, indeed she did. She worked hard and made it happen. That lady had tenacity. And she loved her husband and her son very much, clearly. (laughs) 